should not despise the Muslims. We need to love them as Christ loved them. He loved them so much he died for them. And yet, we also need to have a healthy fear or respect for the implications of this occultic religion. To give you a little bit of perspective on Islam, it's useful to, first of all, strip away some of the misconceptions that we've all been exposed to. Islam did not begin with Muhammad. All the history books were painted that way. It's useful for you and I to take a glimpse at pre-Islamic Arabia. In fact, let's go back to, if we go back to Genesis 12, we discover that God called Abraham, in verse 1 of chapter 12, out of the Ur of the Chaldees. Why did God call him out of the Ur of the Chaldees? Well, for lots of reasons. One of them, of course, is to understand who the spiritual ruler of Ur was. The spiritual ruler of the Ur of the Chaldees was the moon god that would ultimately become the supreme deity of the Babylonian Empire and others. He went by many names. One of the most interesting names in ancient times was the name Sin. Now we, we are familiar with the word Sin as an Old English term, an archery term, meaning to miss the mark. Separate from that, the word Sin in the Assyrian language was their name for the moon god. One of their prominent kings was Sennacherib. Sin Nekarib, Sin multiplies his brothers, what the term means, he's named after the moon god. Now this moon god was elevated to the top of the Babylonian pantheon by Nabu Naid, that is Nabonidus, in an effort to make the Babylonian religion more palatable, acceptable, marketable to uh, uh, subjects like the Arabians and the Arameans. Because they, while the Arabians esteemed the moon god, they, they had a tough time with Marduk and some of the other Babylonian deities. So the Babylonians were shrewd, they just did some repackaging here. The moon god Sin, the word really means the controller of the night, had as his emblem the crescent moon. We'll be talking more about that as we go on here. And he also, uh, in effect, presided over a lunar-based calendar. That became one of the primary religious symbols of the ancient cultures and is to this very day the primary symbol of Islam, the crescent moon, and they still uh, operate all their festivals and things by the crescent moon. They, they fast in Ramadan from crescent moon to crescent moon and so forth. You're very familiar with that. So as we shift the calendar and start looking at Arabia long before Muhammad, we discover that Mecca was the center of all pagan religions in the area known as Arabia. In Mecca, they had a strange device called the Kaaba, a large black stone fell from heaven. Every, most scholars presume it was a very ancient meteorite or what have you. It becomes venerated in this curtained cube called the Kaaba. The lord of the Kaaba was the moon god known as Ila. Al-Ila was the, the god, the moon god. The Kaaba was the, he, the Lord of the Kaaba was the head of 360 idols, maybe more. Now because of these idols, and because of the pagan worship surrounding them for centuries, it was required of their followers to visit, make a pilgrimage to Mecca. That has some pragmatic aspects. As a result, Mecca became the center of very lucrative caravan routes, as you can imagine. And that put some economic motivation behind the maintenance and development of these pagan rituals. If you take the trouble to dig into the worship of the moon god, this is long before Muhammad, you discover that it also involves things called jinns. And it's from those terms that you and I in English get the term genie. We all have been exposed to the Arabian Nights and some of that folklore which derives from these ancient pagan practices, genies and fairies, heavily occupied with spells, magic stones, fetishes, all, all various kinds of what's called animistic beliefs. The Sabians, which were before Muhammad, had a religion that exemplifies all of this sort of thing. It was an astral religion, worshipping heavenly bodies. The moon, strangely enough, was regarded as a male deity. 
the sun was a female deity. This is different than many cultures. Other cultures worship these things just the other way around. But in Arabia, the moon was the male deity. And the stars were considered their offspring. And out of all of this, of course, because the, the dominant male deity was the moon, they had a lunar calendar and they fasted, as they say, from crescent moon to crescent moon. They had a tradition of bowing and praying towards Mecca. Why? Because that's where all their idols were. They required pilgrimage. The pilgrimage involved visiting the Kaaba and uh, uh, circling it seven times and then running to the Wadi Mina to throw stones at the devil. That was the tradition that goes in the Sabian religion long before Islam makes its debut. When Muhammad comes along, what he does is he repackages this in a monotheistic form. And Al-Ilah, or Allah, as he has already previously been uh, called Allah, as I'll come back to that, is, is simply uh, uh, the, the, the Lord. He's still the Lord of the Kaaba to this day. Let's talk a little bit about the life of Muhammad. I'll spare you a whole historical thing here. But there was a particular tribe in the ancient times that had the, the mandate, the franchise, to maintain the Kaaba. You can imagine what that meant economically. That was quite a franchise. The Karish tribe, the Karish tribe uh, was devoted to Allah, the moon god. And you want some interesting evidence of that, all you have to do is look at the names of Muhammad's relatives. His father was Abd Allah, and his uncle was Obied Allah. The name Allah already appears in most of their naming. The pagan family devotion to Allah is very manifest in pre-Muhammadan times, and committed to the moon god. And of course, as I say, they worshiped, uh, they, they bowed towards Mecca because that's where their idols were located. When Muhammad develops his religion, it's packaged, of course, after their, the traditions they were used to, which explains one reason why it was so widespread. What Muhammad apparently tried to do was to package his religion eclectically, picking the best of what he was aware of. The caravan routes through Mecca, of course, had, uh, uh, during his previous 40 years, had educated him, in part, as to what the Jews believed and what the Christians believed. Many of his conceptions of what they believed are rather peculiar. You need to remember something else that helps explain the, some of the bizarre things in the Quran is that there was no Arabic Bible until the 9th century. And so much of Muhammad's perceptions of what he thought the Christians and the Jews believed were from hearsay and his, the garbling of the chronology is at best uh, weird. So, Muhammad believed in his own mind that the Jews would be just as quick to accept his new religion as the Arab, uh, Arabic tribes were. The Arabic tribes embraced it. Well, some of them fought them for quite a while, but the sword explained the program to them a little.